Hi, I'm Don Ciclari and I'm here with Fred Stockwell in uh, Thailand on the uh, border with Myanmar, sitting in a uh, rebuilt garbage dump. I met Fred last week and was quite inspired by his story. He was an aerial photographer, originally from the UK, who had a business in the US, and discovered a bunch of refugees living in literally a garbage dump 10 years ago and dedicated his life to helping these refugees build a, a better life. And the progress he's made in the last 10 years is remarkable. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about how you got here, what inspired you, and how you came to do what you did? So, it was just over 10 years ago. And as you said, I was a photographer. And I was out doing some project work in this part of the world, in Thailand. I used to live in Oregon, in Ashland. And so I... Every so often I'd go out and pick up photos of things I was personally interested in, which at that time was temples and Buddhism and you know, it was a, really it was over good imagery, good colour, good everything. There was nothing in depth after that, but anyway, I got to Mesa, I arrived here, I said just over ten years ago, and I got here because I got on the wrong bus. But it turns out I turned up in a town which was basically an NGO come do good town. There was lots of activity here because a lot of the Burmese, which is only two miles to the border here, were coming over and working here. There's refugee camps. And I met a lot of people. And I was at a point in my life that I could have made some changes. But anyway, I met the right people, started to think, well, I could do something. But then I found the garbage dump. By chance, someone drove me over here. This garbage dump was very isolated, very disorganised. It was where the trucks dumped the garbage. Not an organised landfill. Just dumping it. And we saw that today. It was dumped everywhere. It's dumped everywhere. And I met some people and I kind of liked the idea of being here and doing something. But the turning point was when I spent a little bit more time here and realised that these people really were totally abandoned to everyone, to NGOs, groups, anyone that had come here to do something. This wasn't something they wanted to deal with. It was way beyond, I believe it was way beyond anything they could do. It was too big. But I kept coming back and the decision was made when I started to take out dead babies. Dead babies? Dead babies. They was the thing that really upset me. They were dying of malnutrition. There was a lot of... Uh, kids here not eating right, not getting good food. And most of the food is what they found in the garbage, so stuff that people have thrown away is what they were so eating. So the refugees were living here in the garbage, going through the garbage for food? Yes. Wow. PC here was one of them. Her mother was one of them. PC is off camera, she's sitting here with us. And we'll bring her in in a minute, maybe she can say a few words. So, you know, I found it personally then really tough to deal with. My situation was that you know, I'm, I was 70, no, I was 65 then. And like some people, like yourself, had a pretty good life, you know, done a lot of stuff. And it felt right to try and do something. So, the long story short, I came back, sold up in America, came back and said, okay, let's see what we can do. And I think the selling up in America, you know, you have to make these decisions. You, you just don't try this stuff. You go out and do this stuff. And so that's what I did. I came here and started work. You just gave up everything in America, sold it all, moved here with the intention of helping these people in a garbage dump. That was the plan. An easy decision if you're single and you're, you know, like you, financially I think you're okay. I was, you know, I wasn't sort of relying on people to yep. give me money to yep. live yep. or to give me money so I could do this. Right. That never was never a thought. And there wasn't any thought of even raising money. Quite honestly, I just thought, well, let's see what I can do. It really developed into something. The learning process, there was people with no shoes, no boots, no food, like I said, dead boat. It was pretty atrocious. It made Thunderdome look like pretty good. <laughs> and so, and you know, like a lot of people, yourself, mate, a lot of people that have been in business, I think, you know, a challenge is part of it as well. Uh, so anyway, I stayed and started to work out what I could do. Not having ideas, I'll do this and do that. You don't know what you're gonna do mm -hmm. because you don't know what the needs are, you don't know what, how to do things. We had no language, there was absolutely no 
English here whatsoever. I've got no Burmese or Thai, still don't. So that was the beginning of OK. Now PC, who you say, is off camera, who was a little Todd like this. Very funny. And I think there was a kind of a connection and your hearts go out to different people. Well, her and I, we became friends. She was an instigator of lots of things that I did. She still is. She still is. <laughs> I've seen that today. No, she's got me around a little finger. <laughs> But she was the one, I can remember driving along in the car and she says, I want to know what you say, but she didn't say, she said it in Burmese. At that time I was hiring translators so that I could find ways of communicating. Translators are not always a good idea because you don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> it turned out some of them weren't even saying what I was trying to say. So anyway, and I'm going to skip years here, I can only give you the, the shorthand version, but it was pretty obvious these if I taught them English, I could set up communication, and that's what I did. I found a woman that was really good at teaching English. Uh, I was teaching them English, and we, we finished up with about 20 kids that learning English, and they're speaking English. Now I've got communication. Some of them are fluent now. They're better than me. <laughs> and they're all PCs, A's, they're, run, they're running between 14, 15, up to 18. <coughs> Mostly girls. Girls showed the interest. So that was communications. Now, there were no roads to this place, so they were very isolated, and I was getting called out. I supplied, started supplying phones, some had phones, very few, but I knew if they had phones, we got communication, so we got English communication. Mm -hmm. And this is only a, a small part of the direction what we do. There's a lot of other stuff coming along with this while I was doing that. So once I got the phones going, then then they could call me, and they did a lot, at two, three o'clock in the morning, because so I'm doing all the medical stuff, taking them to clinics, uh, so I could come out here at all hours and find them. Before, I couldn't find them, because this area is quite big. Didn't know where they were, or they could call me. There was no language. What do you want? Oh, Why are you calling right, me? Right, right. So I used to teach them basic words, like, just say clinic. <laughs> yep. So I taught everyone the word clinic. Yeah, yeah. That you know, means a medical problem. Medical. Yeah. So I'd come out here and then find them eventually, <clears throat> and then get into the clinic. A lot of births. But I've delivered babies in the back of my truck, and we've had babies die. I, I, the thing that really, you know, is is heartbreaking are your stories about the dead babies you found. That's that. That's a game changer. Yeah. When I you imagine. see a baby die for no reason whatsoever, other than the mother had no money, didn't know what to do, no breast milk, and there's no one there to do something. And now I'll pan around in, in a minute, but Fred has turned this kind of central area of the dump into what's now called Buddha Land. Cleaned it up, the people have hygiene, they have food, they're healthy, they have basic electricity, they're playing soccer, football in the field here, they're building a temple over here. There's a lot that, that's really happening. So Fred, I want to ask you, what do you see going forward? What do you need? How can how can people help you? Because I know that when you came here, there were NGOs everywhere because of the crisis with with uh, in Burma and so forth. I know you've outlived them. They've come and gone. They've, gone. they've made their their pick pretty pictures and done what they can do. And yeah. and a lot of them I know are you know, came in to take pictures and generate a lot of money and stuff like that, but really weren't able to help the people the way you did. Well, an NGO and what I call the do-gooders and different groups like really. They're not in it for the long haul. Yeah, sure. And anyone that's done business knows you've basically got to be in it for the long haul. So you you gave up your life to move here permanently, yeah. to dedicate your life to helping these people. Absolutely. So how can people help you? Well, since over the 10 years, and I say we haven't got time to talk about the whole thing, but what I've managed to do two years ago, we had no school in here for the kids as such. I managed to get 30 kids into school. But it's a good school. Uniforms, shoes, feet, books, mm -hmm. bags, that doesn't go away. Now I can manage some of that on my own. I could manage all of it on my own actually. But then there's the other problems. Here we have a hundred, uh, no, how many families here? I'm not sure how many. How families. many families total, how many people total are under your umbrella? There's a hundred families, which is 500 people. Okay. On this piece of land, I can't be sure because we've had some new people come. There's probably, how many houses here? 35? 40? More? I don't know. Let's say 40 is a number. Now, we've talked about the kids and their problems. We've got an elderly problem. Hmm. And the elderly pay a high price here. They can't work. They haven't got family. 
And so they need food, they need medical, they need basic health. It's not expensive. Things in Thailand aren't expensive, but it's still got to be supplied because it gets more expensive when you've got 20 people or 30 people. But there was no care for the elderly. They were in a shopping state. So you've got the elderly, you've got the young mothers, you've got the babies, you've got the kids for school, and that's just four in a, in a group of people. So there's always problems. Um, food has been a problem. Medical's been a problem. And it's been a problem because I'm supplying it all myself. The clinics are like a 10, 15 minute drive from me, so I get to the clinic. Yeah, and I've seen you go to the, your <clears throat> car as like a mini pharmacy. You have all the basic needs to give out people when they need it. Now that's come over the years of learning what to do. Well, you're a doctor. People have had doctors come here, other people come here. I glean things and I can ask questions. Um, so I've managed to carry in my car enough of the medical supplies. And it's all basic stuff. But it's coughs, eye drops, baby coughs, paracetamol, bandages, infections of a problem when you get the cut mm -hmm. and then of course when you get those injuries it's all very well putting a bandage on but you know yeah you're gonna do it again tomorrow yeah, yeah and exactly you've got to keep an eye on and we've had a lot of deaths here people that really shouldn't have died through well, neglect is one of them or through ignorance or mm -hmm. not getting to the clinic or not getting the help there really isn't anyone to help them they're, but they're very good at being they're very self-sufficient yeah in many i've noticed ways. And i've also noticed it's been really interesting to see how you've encourage them to to work a lot of them do really odd you know odds and ends to, yeah. to make ends meet so you've you've taken a, a group of people who are entirely dependent on a dump for food set them up gave them the basic necessities and taught them how to build a life we started some of the kids in particular like the pcs the girls in particular got them set up in little businesses they fail they get bit, but it's that experience there was nothing else going on for them we've still got a lot of kids here that aren't in school no education whatsoever. They'll be in the garbage or manual for the rest of their life. And when he says in the garbage, he means literally in the garbage. These people will go out to the garbage, the piles of garbage, which we have pictures of, and they will pick through all day the garbage to find commodities like uh, plastic containers and things that can be recycled, which they'll sell to a local recycling company, or treasures for themselves, clothing and or whatever Not else. the clothing they come that comes out of the garbage. Yeah. They wear. But things are, you know, they're improving, they're changing. But, you know, and also as it moves along, what you needed money for in the past, you don't need that anymore because it changes. So now it's this. Now it's like the schooling. I'd like to get a lot more kids into school. We've got football teams now, they're starting to play football. This has helped a lot. Especially the lads really enjoy football. But they really need uniforms and boots. They play in their bare feet most of the time. But when they go off, now we manage to get them. There's other teams around the area. They go there. You know, they don't want to look like the poor kids on the block. Right. So they, right, and they, like, right. they get a yellow shirt and a pair of boots. And it makes them feel good. But what we're really talking about here is not just self-respect, but and this is for the people back home. These people need help. <laughs> And it's not expensive. This is a case where every little bit truly does help because every little bit goes directly to helping these people with basic yeah. necessities. Yeah, I don't need help. They do. <laughs> <laughs> don't buy me Understood. anything. I'm, I'm okay. I've got a little place to live. I live very simple, but I enjoy that. I've got an old truck that does the work. I've got a little motorbike I use for putzing around. So I'm in good shape. Uh, but they're not. They're still not in good shape. It's very like this all the time, anything can happen. Uh, there's emergencies all the time. You have to imagine like a small town in any country. You know, uh, anything can happen. Let's, let's have PC sit. Maybe you can ask her a few questions and she can, in her English, enter. Hey, PC. We can introduce PC, who's 16 years old, is one of the most popular kids in the village. Bring that chair over here. We're going to talk a little bit. Yeah, you know, you can come use, on, use you my can chair. Okay, come and sit PC, here. have a seat. Give some tea. Okay, so... This is PC. Hello, PC. She's not shy. Shy, baby. Uh, no, she's not. She speaks good English. She's my right hand here. I've got a right hand, a left hand, and a, and a foot. And a, everyone. I've got all these people that do things, and that's the whole point here: is to teach the people how to look after themselves, and how to do these things. I'm more of a, almost like a manager now. 
but the, I've really worked hard in this place. I just, there was no water. We still don't have toilets. We're trying to put toilets in. 500 people, we don't have toilets. Think about it. Um, but we're moving that way all the time. So the expenses change. Now one of the problems I get, and it, I know it's good eyed people, but they'll give me money for something. Right. And I might not need that. I need this. Yep. I would encourage people like yourself that when they see what's going on and how this works, I think we've built a better mouse trap in all fairness. But whether it or whatever take off or not. But you need management. People looking you don't need a gang of people here running around telling people how to live or what to do. What you need is and it takes years. It's no no other way about it. It doesn't matter anything, it's a long time to sort this out. Because you've got to understand it as well. And if I made mistakes, oh yeah, I've got things terribly wrong at times. Um, go on, it came right to me. So, anyway. So PC, say a few sorry, words. No, PC. <laughs> so, what's, tell me about school. Do you like school? What school do you go to? So, you've got school. What's your best thing you like to do? Is that football? Yeah, like that. So, what's your best language? Both two. Oh, yeah. Okay, so anything else you want to say? She's shy, okay. <laughs> We're trying to give them a future. And I know we've all got different reasons for doing things, but I really believe that if everyone was to try and make a difference somewhere, it depends on what you believe in. I believe in, you know, I hate what I see in poverty. Uh, we've got it all over the world. I get the feeling we're not that short of money, we're not that short of food, we're just not using it and doing the right thing with things. We haven't got the right people doing these jobs to bring not just cultures and people and, and where it doesn't matter where they live, they shouldn't have to live in the conditions they live in. Keeping in mind, these people's footprints about that big. Mm -hmm. Mine's about that big. And anyone listening, it's probably about that big. <laughs> so they've got a very small footprint. And they're recycling our garbage. Literally. You've seen the plastic. We've got plastic up to the yin yang here. And they literally are recycling the bottles, the plastic, the glass, everything. Yet, they've got the roughest deal of all. These people should be closer to the top. Because they're doing something that not many countries are even taking any notice of. Right. Which is recycling the garbage. Right, right. And they don't get a break. So, you know, this, talking about what I'm doing here, now it's going, it's, it's a huge subject. I've got a lot to say, but I know we don't have the time to talk about it. Well, I, I just wanted to introduce you to the world and introduce your story, and people, you know, if they're called to help, perhaps we will be, we called to help. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think this is a great start, and, you know, we can certainly do more filming in the future of, of the facility and, and the progress and so forth. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things we want to do here is these kids have got a chance to go to better schools. They can go back to Burma, to universities. But it's expensive. My money, you know, the problem with having money is you can spend it all. If you knew when you're going to die, it'd be great. Because uh -huh. you could just run out of money at the right time. But it's not working out that way. So, you know, education, health, the medical's a big deal. Um, a lot of these cars, kids and people here need cards to keep it getting legal. We've got a lot of people that aren't illegal, uh, they're illegal here, but they've lived here and been born here. PC was born on this piece of land, as wow. a lot of these kids. Wow. So when it comes to what people can do, that thing changes, but you know, I need money for pipes. I need to try and get more water systems in here. We've got houses that fall down every so often. I need to re help rebuild the houses. We don't. What we don't do now, or I don't do now, is you have to contribute as well. You have to help out a little right, bit as well. Right. So it's bringing up all these people along at the same time so they get a chance in life. Great. Well, thank you for your time, Fred. I want to take a Good quick pan you. of the soccer field here and yeah. go from there. So PC and Fred, and this is Buddha Land. This is just built last month, this soccer field. and. A building here and this is going to be the temple and this is the nice part of what's known as the dump because it actually is a functioning dump <laughs>